All right, let's get started. So I, uh, as I mentioned in the last lecture, I rearranged the schedule just a little bit to get the content that you need for the homework out there a little sooner. So for homework two, I want to get you at least started on objective one. You'll be able to do this uh, kind of after today, but especially after Friday, you'll be able to do objectives one and two uh, on the homework. Right now, you can't quite do either of them, but by Friday's lecture, using a form and uploading images using that form will be within reach. And then Monday, ooh, let, me, let me double check just to make sure I put it. No, I did make it Wednesday. Wednesday, that lecture, we're going to cover how to do objective three, and then persistent posts, you already have everything you need for this one. This is taking the information from the form and storing it in a database. You already have the database, but you need the form working. You need objectives one and two working before you can get the persistent posts. Uh, and then the cross-site request forgery tokens, that's going to be the third week, uh, Monday of the third week. Uh, the, all of this content, the objectives one through four, or one through three especially, are gonna keep you plenty busy uh, that you won't, probably won't be itching, most of you won't be itching to get to the cross-site request forgery tokens. Um, <clears throat> but with that, uh, and from objective one, you do need, this is why I put HTML templates on Monday, you do need HTML templates as well, uh, but I believe that's something that if you're getting the form content down, you're getting that, uh, that you'll be able to kind of figure out how to do the HTML templates. Uh, but if not, on Monday, I'll cover that explicitly. Uh, and that is pretty open-ended on how you do that. It's generating your HTML programmatically. So it's, I mean, it's basically a lot of string concatenation. But I'll be explicit in the lecture about how exactly uh, you can pull that off. All right, but with that, oh, and my office hours. I almost forgot. I was like, I can't forget. Uh, my office hours are a little different. I marked it on the... Uh, the office hour schedule, but just for today, I had to change my office hours. I have a meeting right after this uh, for an hour. So my office hours won't start for an hour, but I extended them by half an hour, and then I have another meeting. Unfortunately, I can't extend it further than that. So it'll be noon to 1.30, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, so just a heads up on that if you're expecting office hours right after lecture. Uh, Josh will still have office hours right after lecture, as far as I'm aware. So you can still see him in the office hour area. And if he's not able to answer your question within an hour, head over to my office. I'll be there at noon. All right. Anyone have questions before we get into some content? I'm playing with different colors on the slides. So if anybody has votes for colors, you know, let me know. I'm open to it. As long as it's nice for a dark room. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's the, the big thing that I meant to, to mention, too. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, if you send me an email, I can confirm. That I can be like, yeah, I, I, got, your, I got it right here. Um, but team formation due on Friday. So if you haven't formed a team yet, I just checked the form before lecture, and seven teams have been, well, six teams have been formed. Uh, there was a duplicate submission for the same team. Uh, only one of you have to submit the form. But if you submit multiple times, I'm going to manually go through this. There's, I got no automated script to handle team formation because it would take longer to write the script than to just go through it manually. Uh, so if you all submit and you all submit five times and I have 25 submissions for the same team, like, I'll be able to figure out what's going on there. Uh, I'll understand what's, uh, what that is. So at least one of you has to, uh, has to fill this out. Just let me know your U-bits. Uh, name your team. By the end of the, we don't use the team name until presentations at the end of the semester. So last semester, a lot of teams forgot their team name. It's fine. It happens. Uh, if that happens, just email me during presentations and be like, hey, what's our team name again? Uh, you can have four or five members. So if you have a fifth member, let me know there. And your GitHub URL. Create your GitHub URL. And don't change this throughout the semester. This is where we're going to look for grading. When we hit the project deadlines, there's no submission at all. We're just going to go to this repo after the deadline and go there, clone it, and grade your stuff from there. Uh, so create your repo and don't change that. Uh, or if you do change it, make sure you let me know so I can update our records so me and the TAs know where to find your project. It must be public. 
If you actually have a legitimate reason, I've never heard a legitimate reason for this, but if you do have a legitimate reason that you need a private repo, uh, we can talk about it, we can discuss, um, and then I'll probably say no anyway. But uh, other than that, public repos only. Uh, usually students want private repos just, I don't know, because they want private repos. Uh, but private repos for a class just, it complicates things quite a bit. Uh, you can only have a certain number of members before you have to start paying, things like that. It's, we're not going to deal with it. Um, so form your team. So if you haven't formed a team yet, get to talking. Get in Piazza. I believe we have the uh, group formation post on Piazza active. Uh, hop in the Discord, go into the 312 channel, and be like, yo, I'm looking for a team. Um, get those teams formed. If you don't form a team by the deadline, I'm just going to assign you, excuse me, I'm just going to assign you a random team. There's really no punishment for that, I suppose. So if you just want a random team, just let that deadline pass. You'll get an email from me saying, here's your team. So I'll take whoever's, uh, anyone who's not in a team, I'm just going to start clumping you up. And if there's you know, a situation where I can't put you all in groups of four or five, I'm going to add you to random teams. So if you have a team of four, you know, just a heads up, you might get a, uh, an extra member. Uh, and if you submit the form with a team of three, you're 100% going to get an extra member out of the students who haven't filled out a team. Um, or with a team of three, I might just break you up, split all three of you up, you know, because you can't form a team of three. But uh, I think that's all I want to say about that. Any questions about this? Uh, and then, oh, one more thing. So once, so teams are due this week. Next week, it's already week five almost. Can you believe that? The semester's going by, uh, going by fast. Uh, starting week five, you'll start your weekly team meetings. So go to this project section, this team meeting form. You're going to fill this out each week. You're going to fill this out. Tell me what you did since the last meeting. Tell me what you're going to do before the next meeting. Uh, for the first few meetings, it's fine if you say, we didn't do anything. You know, that's perfectly fine. But let me know that uh, in the forms. Uh, so at the end of the semester when we're doing project grading, if I look in like the first five weeks you did nothing, you know, that might factor into some decisions. Um, but if you've been working every week and I, I don't know, it, it'll factor into decisions. Um, and tell me for each teammate, each week, rate each teammate on just some zero to 10 scale. Um, and just tell me how happy you are with each teammate. At the end of the semester, there's only one time where you're actually being graded on the project. So at the end of the semester, I'm going to look at all of these throughout the whole semester and try to identify any slackers in the teams. And then I'll do individual grading. You'll get a project, uh, a team grade for your project. And then I'll adjust that team grade for each individual member based on your performance. If everything was fine in the team, you all just get the, the team score. Uh, but if there was clearly a slacker who did nothing all semester, uh, you know, you're getting a worse grade than your teammates who actually did the project. Uh, so just be aware of that. And if you did the whole project, your teammates did nothing, and your team grades like uh, an 80, you're probably getting 100, and your teammates are probably getting somewhere close to zero-ish. Uh, so just be aware of that uh, and let me know. I don't use math directly on the numbers that you give me. So in some courses, the instructors will take these numbers and throw it into a formula and directly compute your grades based on that. I don't do that, but I take these, this information and use that to inform my decisions. If somebody got a lot of poor scores, I'm going to go into your repo and see, uh, look at their commits, see what they actually contributed. And if they actually didn't contribute anything, then I'm going to make the decision to adjust their grade downward. Uh, but if they have a lot of poor scores, but they have a lot of really good code in the repo, for example, you know, I'm not going to touch their score. Uh, uh, but that's all decisions like me as a human looking at all of the information available to me and deciding, did this person slack off or not? Uh, so fill these forms out. By the way, if somebody has a lot of poor scores, this is the easiest decision for an individual grade adjustment. Uh, a lot of your teammates say one zeros didn't do much throughout the entire semester. And the student they're saying that about didn't even fill out these forms. Easy decision for me. That's a low grade. Uh, fill out these forms. Uh, there's no official thing in the grading that says you must fill these out. It's 5% of your project grade. Uh, but if you don't fill these out, like, I know you're the slacker. Like, uh, come on, man. Uh, 
So just be aware of all that. Uh, so they'll start next week. Team meetings, schedule them on your own time. They are technically the recitations, so make sure you're, you're scheduling those and getting those team uh, meeting forms in. All right, any other questions on all that? Do you know what you're doing to start this project? OK. Let's talk about HTTP POST. So, so far, everything we've done was a GET request aside from some of the API methods. Um, but in the API, we only created POST requests through Postman. Today, we're going to see how to create POST requests through our front end. We want to get a dynamic front end on our pages to let users interact with our server in a more, meaning, more meaningful way and more specifically in, interact with each other. Oh, I'm dying up here. Um, so let's talk about it. First, let's have a little segue over into query strings. I used to have this as an objective on the homework. I removed it from an objective, so I kind of downplayed in lecture now. Oh, I still want to make sure you know what query strings are. I'd feel bad if you didn't know what they are coming out of this class. So query string allows users, allows your users to send more information in the URL of a request. And this is common in search engines. If you make a, a Google search or a DuckDuckGo search or whatever search engine, uh, all the ones I've checked will put your search request right in the URL. It's not special information in headers. There's no body to a post request or anything. It's a get request with your query in the URL. So if you make a search and then look at the URL bar in your browser, sometimes it shortens it and hides all the information. But if you click on it, you can get or cut and copy it, paste it somewhere. You'll get all the information. You'll see your search terms in the URL directly. So that looks something uh, like this. So recall the structure of a URL. Protocol, HTTP or HTTPS for us. Uh, host and port, usually just the domain name. And then port is the default, either 80 or 443. The path that's being requested. And then the query string is followed by a, follows a question mark. If there is a question mark in the URL, the part after the question mark, but before any hashtag, if a hashtag exists, that is the query string. The query string is going to be a set of key value pairs. So in this example, we have the start of a query string, a value, uh, a key Q or name. Sometimes it's name value in these, uh, the terminology. E that's set equal to web development. So this is a search for a DuckDuckGo search for the term web development. And then key value pairs, if you have multiple, separated by ampersands. And I'm saying this is an image search. I have the name IA equal to images. So I want to make an image search for web development. If you don't use DuckDuckGo's form, their search box at all, and you just type this directly into the URL bar in your browser, you'll su successfully make a search for images of web development. You don't have to use their box at all if you don't want to. But uh, typically, it's easier to, to do that. Uh, and then the fragment, uh, we don't really use it all, but that's used typically for navigation to give a direct link to a specific part of a page. So the query string, question mark, start of the query string, key value pairs separated by ampersands, the key and value separated by an equal sign. So this does imply, and, uh, and I have a whole slide on it in a little, little bit, uh, question mark, equal sign, ampersand, these are special characters in a URL, which means you cannot have them in your path, in your domain name, in your query string values, names and values themselves, in your fragment. You can't have these anywhere except to denote their special meaning. A question mark can't exist in a URL unless it's saying this is the start of the query string. So just keep that in mind when you're naming paths. If you want to start using special characters and paths, you want to have big, long tokens in your paths uh, for some reason, uh, like a lot of URLs do. Uh, those tokens can't include any of these special characters. URLs also only ASCII values. The URL, the path, so everything after uh, the port and then slash, 
Everything after that goes into your HTTP request line, which is kind of part of the headers. It's part of that first part of your HTTP request, which, as we know, is ASCII only. Only ASCII in the headers. Everything before that blank line that starts the body. So therefore, only ASCII in, uh, in this query string. Uh, since that's going to be in part of the path, the query string and fragment are all going to be in path. Are all going to be in that first line of your HTTP request. So ASCII only, and no white space. If there's white space, one of the first lines of code in your server says split on spaces. Take the first line, split on spaces. That's going to break if we have white space in uh, in the URL, in the path itself, in the query string, in the fragment. Not allowed. That's actually the way to parse. You look for those white spaces. If we allowed white spaces in paths, uh, that's not just like CC 312. That's the standard. The spec says no white space in these things. No white space allowed. Because everybody's parsers would break. Because how, how do we even find the boundaries of the values then? So there are a lot of characters that we can't have. Anything that's non ASCII, and some even ASCII characters we can't have. So sometimes we want these characters in our, uh, in our values. Like a space, where well, somebody searches for something with a space in it, like that has to go into our query stream. So we saw the examples. Uh, the search engines for that specific example will replace the spaces with plus signs, uh, which denotes an array, just the way that they use things. The, uh, the plus is a special character that denotes multiple values in an array. Uh, but if you have a case where you need to encode a space or any other character, we use percent encoding. A percent sign and then the bytes of the, uh, the encoded character as hex. So percent 20, you've probably seen this quite a bit in URLs and said, why do I have all these percent 20s? It looks really weird in URLs. That's a percent encoded space character. So two, zero, I, I say percent 20, but not 20 in base 10, uh, but 2, 0 in hex should be 32, right? If I know my, my values, which I may or may not. Yeah, 32. Uh, so 32 in base 10, that's going to be the ASCII character, the ASCII encoding for a space character. So those percent two zeros in your URLs, space. There's just URL encoding a percent encoding a space because we can't have spaces in the URL. So we percent encode it. Which is basically escaping it. Uh, we can represent any UTF-8 characters. Just give it all the bytes. So this is a three-byte uh, UTF-8 character. So we got the three bytes there, and we can represent that in our URL using this percent encoding. Uh, I already said all that. And finally, our reserved characters. So this is a complete list, comprehensive list of all of the reserved characters for URLs. You can't use any of these characters in a URL unless you're using them for their reserved purpose. So any of these, not allowed. Uh, several of them are used in the query strings, like we just mentioned. Um, but what I want to highlight are the characters that are not reserved. It's a much shorter list, but these characters are allowed in your URLs. So when you're creating your pathing, path you're creating a query string mechanism, uh, which I removed from this course, I don't make you do that, but out there in the real world, uh, you're generating your query strings, you're generating tokens uh, that are going to go in the URL. These values are allowed. Dashes, dots, underscores, and tildes. Those you can use to your heart's content. They have no special meaning in a URL, so use them for days. Use them however you want to use them. Uh, those ones are allowed. Anything over here has special meaning, don't use them. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah, catch my breath for a minute. Okay. All right, so let's talk about dynamic pages. This is what we want to do for homework too, is build a page where your users can interact with each other, a dynamic page where the content is changing based on user actions. Kind of did this with the API in homework one, uh, where they can change the data on the server, but now we want to 
put that, uh, put a front end to that. Let's build a front end where users can interact with HTML from a user perspective, not an API perspective, where basically only programmers are going to be able to use it effectively. Uh, let's give them a front end and let them interact with our page that way. And that's when we finally become web applications. So far, we haven't done an application. Uh, what we did web pages. Homework one was a web page. Uh, a web application is when you have a back end that's actually like doing stuff instead of just hosting files. So let's get into web applications, the namesake of the course. And for that, we're going to need some HTML forms. So let's build our first form and see how this thing works. So forms, it's a form. I don't have to talk about it too much, right? Um, but what I want to talk about is the HTML side of it. So we have a few extra uh, HTML elements. And this is where I kind of don't fulfill my promise. I'm like, you'll have to look at the documentation for the other HTML stuff. But whenever we need one, I end up showing it anyway. Uh, so HTML forms, labels, and inputs are the three that we're going to see today. Form, pretty self-explanatory, defines a form. But a form is going to have multiple attributes that can modify it, labels and inputs, multiple attributes that can uh, modify the way that they behave and define the way they behave. And I'll talk about each one of those in the next like 10 slides. So whenever an HTML form is submitted, this is going to create a submit button. Do I not have, do I not show what the form looks like? <laughs> I should do that. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's no thr thrills or anything, uh, but this is, it'll say enter your name and then a text box, comment, text box, and then a button that says submit. Uh, so it's not a, a really interesting form visually, uh, but I want to talk about how it works. Uh, so this button, whenever this button is pressed, that's going to send an HTTP request to the server. So whenever a form is submitted, using an input of type submit, it's going to send an HTTP request for, to the server with the form information. And whatever the HTTP response your server sends back, that's what's going to be loaded. So whenever you submit a form, it's going to trigger a page reload. It's going to refresh the page with whatever was responded, or whatever you responded with. So you have a submit. You submit the form, and your server responds with some HTML for the new page, whatever page loads, when you su submit that form. A, hey, confirmation, your form was submitted, um, you know, whatever, uh, whatever the form is supposed to do. Uh, for our homework, that's going to be a redirect. Redirect them, submit the form, and redirect them right back to your home page. And they're going to see the contents of what they submitted should reload when you're home page reloads. Uh, so that'll be important later. We're going to talk about AJAX in WebSockets to avoid that page reload. For just vanilla straight up forms, it's going to trigger a page reload, which we will want to avoid later. Uh, a lot of sites that you use, whenever you click a, a button, it doesn't always trigger a page reload. Of course, that would be terrible. But if you're using just a straight up HTML form with an input of type submit, uh, then it's going to trigger a page reload. If you have a button that's not part of a form and you're using some JavaScript, you can avoid that page reload using AJAX. It's something we'll talk about in a bit, in like two weeks. But we'll get there. Right now, every form is going to trigger a page reload. So let's take a look at this. Our form is going to have at least two attributes that are required to make this thing work. Are they required? I don't know if they're required. I feel like methods should default to get, but I don't know if it does or not. Um, I would like them to be required if they're not. So two things. Action, this is the path that's going to be requested when this form is submitted. So when I submit this form, you're going to get a request on your server for slash form path as the path. And then method, which HTTP method should be used to send this form? I'm going to say, send me, uh, give me a get request. This is going to send a get request to the path form path with all the data that I'm sending. We have inputs. Uh, these are going to be your box, you know, any area where a user can input information. 
Here I have type text. If you change that type, you're going to get all kinds of different types of inputs. Here I have type text, so you're just going to get a text box. Box where a user can type. No, no frills, not too fancy. But that's how we do it. If you want a text box in your, uh, in your page, that's it. Uh, type text. And then I'm going to put the name. Name is going to be very important to us. That's going to be the name of the value when we receive it on the server side. So name commenter, when I receive a request of this form submission, when I get a get request on slash form path, I'm going to look for something called commenter. And I'm going to know that that's whatever, well, the value of that is whatever the user typed into this box defined by this HTML input. Yes? That's, that's a good question. I, I will get to that one. So right now, we're setting this as a get request, which isn't what we're going to end up doing. Uh, the, the name of this lecture is get uh, post request. Uh, but since this is a get request, there's no body. So this will actually go in the URL we're going to see in a little bit. We're going to change that to post and get to where we actually want to be in a minute. And then it'll go in the body. Uh, and I also have an ID on this input. And that's so I can give it a label. Now, I don't talk about front end stuff too much or accessibility or some. This one's important. And honestly, it's kind of just a pet peeve of mine. Like, do this for all your sites, please, please. Uh, label is going to give some context for some other element. And it's going to have a for attribute, which takes the ID of the element for which this label, that this label labels. So this label is for form name. It's for the input with the ID form name. So this is going to inherently link this label in this box. Please do this. Don't just put enter your name as text without any HTML elements and then just physically locate it next to the box. Use the label and for with an ID to link these two inherently. Uh, there are a few things for this. One is great for screen readers. Uh, the screen reader has, like, if somebody is visually impaired and they're using your site, they need to use a screen reader. They can't visually see that that label is physically close to that box. So they can't really tell what that box is for. It's just a text box. And then there's a bunch of text somewhere that says, enter your name, comment. And they don't know what to do. Uh, you put the label, the screen reader knows what to do with that. Um, for the rest of us, when you click on this, enter your name, when you click on that, it will shift the focus to the text box. So you don't have to click exactly on the text box. It's a nice convenience for us, uh, especially with radio buttons, when you have like multiple choice options, like for your lecture questions, uh, which I don't even have any labels. Oh, no, I have A, B, D, C, and E. Um, if you click on the letter, it should select, I, oh goodness, I hope I remember to do this now that I'm saying it. When you click on the letter, it should select the corresponding radio button. I, I have to check, because this is going to bug me. Goodness gracious, I hope I remember to do that. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I didn't forget. So if you click, so I have my label set up. I usually don't forget, but I, I didn't know 100% for sure. So I have my label for C, ID of C. So when you click on the text, it's going to select that radio button. You do that using the, the label for the input, so you can get that feature. If not, you have to select the circle directly. And I don't know about y'all, but it's just one of my pet peeves. When, Sites don't do that, and I actually have to click the button itself. Uh, it irritates me, and I also know that they're not uh, access. Uh, they're not thinking about their accessibility. They don't care about people using screen readers. You know, their their site is not easy to use for certain groups of people. Uh, so aside from annoying me, I know that they're really pissing off other people because makes their sites basically unusable uh, to a certain group of people. So I don't talk much about front end, but that's something that. Just please use labels for any of your inputs. Oh, yeah, thanks, Nicholas. 
Like this is the, a picture of one of my forms. Can we use method outside of form? I don't know if method has any effect outside of forms. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen it used anywhere outside of a form. I don't think it would have any effect. But it might. I, I might be wrong on that. Oh, and Nicholas answered it anyway. Yeah, when you have to get precisely in the center of a checkbox instead of clicking anywhere in the text that represents that checkbox, that, that checkbox represents, oh, it's frustrating. Frustrating and poor accessibility. So, so again, I'll leave the rest to Alan, but that's one thing, like, please use your labels. If I have to click on your radio button or your checkbox, oh, man. Uh, the, uh, the site I go to approve TA timesheets, I have to deal with that every, every frickin' time. Uh, I, there's a checkbox, approve this timesheet, and it says, approve this timesheet, and there's this big, long text, and I want to click anywhere in that text, but... No, like 30 times every other week, I have to click directly on the thing. Anyway, uh, and then finally, an input of type submit. If your input is of type submit, give it a value. This is going to give you a button, and the button is going to say whatever you give it in value. So value equals submit. I'm going to have a button that says submit, and when you click on it, it's going to submit this form. You can put whatever you want here. You want to put order or uh, confirm or whatever. That's the text that's going to show up on the button. And we used method equals get. So that's the HTML side of things. Now let's talk about the functionality. We used method equals get. So this is going to send a get request to our path. So how is this going to work? Well, it's going to be a good old query string. So when we submit this form, this is what we're going to get. I put get good morning exclamation point reserved character, so it's going to be percent encoded. And this is how it's going to be. The name equals whatever value I typed in. I type Jesse as my name, and then good morning exclamation point as my comment. That's how it's going to look when you receive it on the other end. Now, don't panic. We're not going to parse this. Uh, you're not going to parse percent encoding either. I think that's just tedious and boring. For, uh, for what we want to do in this course. Uh, but that's how it's going to appear on the other side. But that's not what we want. This has, aside from just being annoying, this has strict limitations. Uh, you'll have a lot of percent encoding, sure. But we also have limitations to the size of the headers. Everything before that blank line in an HTTP request, which includes all the headers and the request line, which is where that query string is going to go. There are limitations to the size of that. Most servers are going to limit it to uh, 4 to 16K-ish. Uh, your buffers are probably mostly set to 1K. You're going to read 1K off of the TCP socket and then expect all the headers to be there. Right? At this point in the course, you're expecting, until objective two, you're expecting the entire request to be right there. So what happens if we want to upload a file? Maybe, just maybe, sometime in your life, you'll want to upload a file that's more than 16K. Well, that's going to overflow even the most generous servers. Uh, this is just not practical. It's not feasible. We're, we can't use get requests to upload data to a server. Just not going to happen. Let's talk about post requests. So post is going to solve this for us. This is when we want to send data to a server that needs to be processed. We're going to use a post request. And when we read a post request, we're going to see those content length and content type headers. For homework one, we could ignore, pretty safely ignore both of these. For homework two, especially when you get to objective three, but most times objective two as well, you're going to actually have to read that content length header. And we'll talk about that for like the next week or so. You do actually have to parse and read that content length header. Content type, you can still just assume, OK, you're sending a post request to this path. I'm expecting JPEGs. You know, uh, you should read it, but I have no real way of enforcing you of reading that. So it's whatever. So post request, you're going to get everything after that blank line. 
as the body. I'll skip through a bit of this since you already did post requests uh, a little bit on homework one. But everything after that blank line is going to be the body of the request, and everything before are the headers of the request. So to send post requests to our form, well, let's just change the method to post. We change the method to post, and now when I submit this form, I'm going to get a post request on my server. So now I submit this form, I'm going to get a post request for form path, and that query string, it's not going to be a query string anymore, it's going to be a URL encoded message in the body of my request. So now I'm looking for this blank line, which is the slash r slash n slash r slash n. I'm looking for that. Everything before that I know is headers in the request line. Everything after that I know is the body. I'm going to look at my headers. I know I'm going to have content length and content type. Of course, if you use your browser, you're going to have a whole bunch of more headers that would just clutter up my slide. Uh, but you're at least going to have content length and content type in those headers. Oh, I guess I'll explicitly read the foreshadow too. Um, what happens when we have a file? So if you're using Python and you're reading from the socket and if you use my code from slides, you're gonna read from the TCP socket up to 1K bytes, 1024 bytes. What happens when you have a two, byte, a two kilobyte image? How does that work? Uh, that's going to be next Wednesday's lecture when we talk about buffers. You have to read the content length and then keep going back to the socket to read more and more data until you read content length number of bytes. So that's something coming up. So we do have to read that content length. Because what if I upload a one megabyte image, which you better guarantee for testing objective three, uploading large images, it'll at least be a megabyte that we upload for testing. Uh, how, how is that gonna work? How do you do that? Do you just say read it up to a megabyte? Well, then we're gonna upload a two megabyte file. Uh, how do you handle that? How do you handle arbitrary file sizes? We're gonna talk all about it coming up. But first, we still gotta figure out how to finish up these forms and get forms in a nice format. Uh, so switching that method to post, send a post request, but the body was still URL encoded. We had this percent encoding stuff. We had these key value pairs, uh, which can't contain any non-ASCII characters, and there are some ASCII characters that it can't contain. So we gotta worry about all this percent encoding. And what happens when we have a file that can't be, uh, can't be easily encoded like that? So for that, we're going to change our encoding type. So we're gonna add another attribute to this form, the encoding type, and we're gonna set the encoding type to multi-part form data. And this is the final version of forms, the final setup anyway, of forms that we'll use in the course. This is what the one in the homework handout looks like. Uh, post request, method equals post, encoding type, multi-part form data. And this is actually required. If you've used, uh, if you wrote websites before and you had to support file uploads, at some point you had to do this on your front end. You had to set the encoding type to multi-part form data. And you might have wondered, why, am I, why do I have to do this? Uh, if you want to upload images through a form, it has to be multi-part form data. If you don't have this, the data of the file isn't sent. The browser just won't send it you only get the file name that the user uploaded, which usually isn't of much import to you. There's an area where you prefer using forms with get instead of post. Bookmarking pages and search engines, I'll buy that. Yeah, search engines would be a, could be a form submission. They probably are using JavaScript, but it could be a form submission using Git, uh, the way we had our first form set up. But we want image uploads. We're going to do it like this. So the encoding type is going to change the way things are formatted. There are only three options for this, multi-part form data, which we're interested in, URL encoded, which is the default, 
and text, which should never be used. Text is terrible. It takes your text and doesn't percent encode it. So if anybody submits an, an invalid character, uh, things are just going to break. And how do you send multiple, uh, multiple pieces of data with text? Uh, even the documentation says only use text for debugging purposes, never use it in production. So multi-part form data, this is what we want. And when we send this, now we get this request. It's a bit more complicated. There's a lot more going on here. But this is what we're going to get when we use multi-part form data. This is the way that's structured. And this is what we're going to learn how to parse, not today, but on Friday, how to parse this thing. Uh, but this is what we'll get. Our content type. Oh, I did lie a little bit. You do have to read your content type for this, for this homework. Your con I forgot boundary goes in content type. So content type, multi-part form data, and we'll have an additional value called a boundary, which is going to be some random looking string. And then in the body of the request, so after a blank line, you're going to see that boundary, which is going to separate multiple pieces, multiple parts of the request. And each part, each piece of that form, each input is going to have its own part in the request. So I have name commenter, value Jesse, name comment, and good morning without the percent in quoting, coding. I actually get the UTF-8 characters this time. Next lecture, we're spending the whole lecture talking about how to parse this stuff. We're going to go way in depth on this format. Uh, so, so this will come back. I know I'm just flashing it today, uh, Friday. It's all about this. And just real quick, we have a few other HTML inputs. Uh, just in case you're curious, uh, a few other ones. I ended up just showing the code for the lecture questions. Uh, but if you want a radio button, a set of them, give them all the same name and different values, and then only one of these and type radio. And only one of these will be able to be selected at a time, as long as they all have the same name. And then whatever one's selected, you'll, on the server side, you'll get name, chose one, and then value, whichever one was selected. And drop down for what it's worth. I don't, this is why I don't like just going through like HTML elements. I never have anything to say. It's like, yeah, that's how you do it. I don't have any commentary to add to it. It's just how you do it. Uh, you have a select instead of, uh, instead of an input, select name equals dropping. Oh, that's just what I called it. Uh, but do a select and then give it options inside of that tag. Uh, and then each option can have a separate value. Name dropping, that's just what I called it, right? And then on the server, you'll get uh, dropping and then whatever value the user selected. I don't like that I called it that. And there are tons of these. If you want to learn more about all the different form input types, uh, there are a lot of them. And most of them, you just take your input and change the type of it. What, uh, next lecture, we're going to take one of our text boxes. And the type, instead of text, we literally change that to file. And we support file uploads on the front end, at least. That's the only change we make on the front end. Everything else is on the back end of handling the requests that are sent that contain file uploads. There's not much I can do in five minutes, so let's just do the lecture question. Once you answer, you can, you're free to go.